like a fidget instead of my cell phone, please go ahead up, head to the back and see Katie. Um, she's, got, she's got fidgets. You just got to trade your cell phone in. Um, and then she'll give you a fidget and you can fidget. All I got to say is when I was in middle school and high school, I really wish that they were fidgets. Like, I didn't, I hardly remembered a word my, my, my uh, youth pastor used to say because my brain's just off and running. I'm just sitting there and he's talking and I'm, I'm doing a whole sermon in my head. Fidgets would have focused me. First thing I would have done is I would have tried to count how many of the little spheres, I didn't say balls because high schoolers are immature, the little spheres <laughs> are inside the bigger sphere. I would have tried to count, which kind of would have been impossible because, you know, they're like little spheres that are like liquid in there with them, so they move all over the place, so you'd count it, and then it would like slide into the back, and you'd recount it. You'd never really know. It would be impossible. Anyway, um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to open us up in prayer. Um, I want to invite you guys tonight. I want to invite you guys tonight to be very attentive. I want to invite you guys to pay attention. I want to invite you guys to open your hearts, shut your mouths, put your phones away, and give me 20 minutes, and let's see what God's going to do. Does that sound good? All right, let's pray. Bless you. Lord Jesus, I come before you right now, um, and I invite you here. I invite you into this, Lord. We just had a great time dancing around and singing, Lord, with the reason we can have joy is because of you, um, or because the tomb is empty. We get to dance around and sing about that and celebrate that, God, because it's one of the best things that that has ever happened to us, that you conquered death. Lord, tonight we're going to dive into a topic that's incredibly difficult. Um, God, if I'm honest, I feel afraid that I'm not going to do it justice, that I'm going to say something that's unclear. And so I just invite you to speak through me. This is about you and the students in this room and not about me. I pray for students, Lord, that you would soften hearts and open ears, that we would hear not what I say, but what you're saying. And give this time to you, Lord Jesus. It's yours. Use it. Would your spirit be present with us? We're going to need you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said. All right, we've been looking at the holiness of God, okay? To put it simply, we basically said that if we could understand the holiness of God, it would radically change our heart's affections, it would radically change our lives, and and ultimately, it would radically change our intimacy with God. I did already invite you guys to be very attentive tonight. I already see some people turn to their neighbors. If you guys could lock in, like, this one's important to me. Lock in for me tonight, okay? Lock in for me tonight. Last week, we began our conversation by looking at the true story of a young girl who willingly gave her life rather than deny Jesus. You guys remember that? If you weren't here, uh, it's pretty simple. Young lady uh, was found to have a Bible in a country where that wasn't allowed. It was discovered. The penalty of that is death. This is a true story I told last week. Um, She was offered the chance to deny her faith in Jesus or be put to death. She chose to be put to death. Um, They took her into a wall in the center of the city. They tore down part of the wall, put her in it, and began to build the bricks around her. The last brick in front of her, they gave her one last chance. She said, Jesus is with me, and the brick was put over, and years later, her bones were taken out and buried. I told you that story because I wanted to ask the question. I wanted to ponder with you what's different about her faith than ours. The reality is there's something different, and and if we could just be honest about that for a moment, there's something different. I think some of us might actually choose to do the same thing, but the the reality is some of us wouldn't, and I I want us to wrestle with the difference. That's what we talked about. What's different about the faith of this girl and the others who are in countries where they're persecuted for their faith? Why is it that they are so, that you and I are so afraid to obey God, They're, they're so afraid, I'm sorry, why is it that they are so afraid to disobey God, and yet you and I do it daily, and many of us couldn't care less? We talked about this last week. I believe the answer is simple. The difference between their faith and ours, many of ours, is that they deeply treasure God. They need Him, and so they value Him above everything else, even life itself. 
So we ask the question, why, how? How does a person come to treasure God like that? How does a person come to need God like that? How, are they, how does a person come to a place where they're willing to forsake everything, including their life, in order to follow Jesus? Why, and why not us? Why can't we be? Why can't we get there? And why isn't our faith like that now? These are the questions we pondered last week. We then looked for the answer to that question and those questions by studying King Solomon. Many of you remember that we talked about King Solomon last week, okay? Uh, by doing so, we were able to see that in the end, the wisest man on earth who learned the hard way that being wise in our own eyes always draws you away from God, the giver of life, and all things good. At the end of Solomon's life, the wisest man on earth who began by following Jesus and eventually used that wisdom uh, and became wise in his own eyes, walked away from the Lord and coming back to God, and he essentially said at the end of his life, the one thing that everyone should do, the only thing that matters is that you fear God. Which is kind of a weird thing to say, right? So, like, a lot of times you see in the Bible, the angels show up, like, don't be afraid. And the Bible over and over and over and over and over invites us, in fact, tells us a lot about the value and importance of actually fearing God. Solomon became wise in his own eyes, just like many of us have. Unfortunately, many of us have yet to come back to God. We talked about how in our lives, daily, moment by moment, most of us simply do not need God, and some of us don't really even want him. Many of us are wise in our own eyes. We believe we can do it on our own, and maybe not. Maybe we wouldn't stand up and say, I don't need God. Maybe we wouldn't go there. But our actions go there, moment by moment, day in and day out. And so God, who is holy completely self-sufficient, has no need for us, loves us, but has no need for us. And in fact, because of his love for us and for himself, has let you go. He's given you what you want, a life without him present. We talked briefly about how many times I talk to students and students are often lamenting and wondering with me why they ask God things in prayer and it feels like he doesn't hear them. And we pose the question, is it possible that God treats your prayers lightly because you treat him lightly. And then we closed with this question last week, and this is where we pick up this week. Is it possible that a person who believes in Jesus, a person who's saved, a person who belongs to God, would be able to view God so lightly? Is it possible that a person who's submitted and committed their lives to God being Lord and he's my king, is it possible that someone who's saved could ever have a relationship with God where you view him so lightly, so carelessly, and so needlessly? Is that even possible? That was the cliffhanger, and we left you there. Before I answer that question, I want to address something that may be happening to some of you in this series and, and will, will potentially, if I don't bring it up, happen again tonight. It's possible that this conversation up to this point has upset you. I've had conversations with a few of you, maybe upset, it's an overstatement, maybe a little confusion. Perhaps you've become frustrated, angry, maybe even with me. Maybe you've felt defensive, you've questioned things I've said or dismiss it thinking, he doesn't know me. If that's you, I want you to know three things. Number one, it's okay to, it's okay. It's human to feel that way. I've reacted to hard conversations about my faith similarly multiple times in my life. And I think the first thing you gotta know is if you're struggling with the things that are being said, don't feel bad about that. You're allowed to be you. Number two, it's, I also want you to know that it's the strategy of Satan to make you angry so that you can't hear. This conversation is undoubtedly a hard pill to swallow. Can you hear me say that? Some of this stuff has been hard. It's those hard pills to swallow where the ones that, the harder they are, it's, it's typically because we need it the most. And God loves us enough to warn us in his word. My question for you is, will you listen even though it's hard? Number three, I want you to hear me say this. I invite you to open up your heart. If God is speaking to you, the pressure will not relent. 
If God is trying to do something in your life and you've held him off of that, then, then the, the defensiveness, the frustration, the anger, and, and like that's, that may not relent. You may have to just kind of push through that. Don't dismiss it just because it's uncomfortable. Back to our question. Is it possible that a person who believes in Jesus, who's saved, who belongs to God, would be able to, go- to view God as lightly as we've been talking about? to care about him so little practically in any moment throughout the day? Is it possible that a person who's actually submitted and surrendered their life to God could ever, like, hold God so lightly and carelessly for for so long in their life? Is that even possible? I'm going to answer with an answer that I think is incredibly biblical, and I'm going to spend the rest of the night trying to build a case for it. Are you ready? I don't think it's possible that a person who believes in Jesus, who's saved and who belongs to God, could ever view God in an extended period of time so carelessly and lightly. I don't think it's possible. To help you understand, I'd like to share a story that I read recently. I'm going to open it, my book, and I'm going to read it to you. You guys ready for story time? Yay. Okay. I just arrived in Hawaii to speak at a leadership conference. My hotel room wasn't ready. So I found a spot to relax under the poolside umbrella. It just so happened that a businesswoman attending a different conference was also waiting for a room. We began talking, and once she discovered that I was a Christian author and minister, she began to elaborate on her relationship with Jesus. It didn't take more than a couple of minutes to realize that she did not know Jesus at all. She kept confidently stating what she believed, but very little corresponded to what Scripture actually reveals to us about Jesus. I, was, I silently asked the Holy Spirit for wisdom, and within moments, he revealed what to say. Once she finished, I asked, Do you see that man sitting across the pool over there? With a surprised look on her face, most likely from the abrupt change of subject, she responded, Why, yes. I cheerfully said, his name is Jim. He's from Fresno, California. He lives on a strict vegan diet. His dream is to be on the United States Olympic water polo team. He works out in both the pool and gym three hours a day. His hobbies are pickleball, skydiving, and painting. Jim's married to this woman just over there by the hot tub. Her name is Beth. She's 10 years younger. Now intrigued by how well I knew him, she asked, is he attending the conference with you? I quickly responded, no, ma'am. She became more curious. How do you know Jim so well? Then I turned, looked her straight in the eyes, and I stated, I've never met him. Her countenance changed and now showed caution, maybe even concern. Perhaps she wondered if I was a stalker, private detective, or even a government agent. I let it sit for a moment, and then I confidently stated, that is what I believe about him. She was speechless. I continued, You spoke with great confidence of your belief of who Jesus is, but almost everything you just said about him is not true. In fact, it's contrary to what the Bible teaches. I know this because I know him. Our conversation was over by her choice, but she was noticeably shaken. In 2 Corinthians 11.4, Paul rebukes the people in the church in Corinth by saying, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach to you a different Jesus. It's clear that what the church in Corinth, that they believe in Jesus, but they don't actually know him. Why? Why? And how? How is it that a person can believe in someone like Jesus, but not know him? What the verse tells us is that they believe whatever appeals to their liking and consequently live far from the real Jesus. They believe what they want about him. And honestly, it's really not that hard to do. We should give ourselves some some slack here. I mean... Like, God's invisible. It's easy to alter his nature to, f- to suit our fancy. It is easy to do. We all do it a lot. I do it a lot. You do it a lot. 
The other realities are is you could have been taught, taught a false Jesus by someone else. We have many sources in our lives that talk about God. I mean, everyone knows that Christian TikTok is a growing thing. Many of us follow all kinds of Christian social influencers. And, and some of you are listening to sermons of people you've never met, you've never vetted what they think. Like we just kind of take in all this content and we go, well, it's a preacher. Of course he's telling me what's true. We have many sources in our lives that talk about God. Number three, if you don't read the word of God, searching, seeking intimacy with God, how could you actually know him? It's really not that hard, as it turns out, to believe in someone like Jesus and to believe things about him, to believe in him, but know him hardly at all. And that is exactly where I fear that many, if not most of us in this room are at. And maybe right now it's starting to bubble up again. You're like feeling slightly offended, a little frustrated, dismissive of the possibility. Maybe you find comfort in the fact, um, maybe, maybe you find comfort in the fact that in your mind, I'm just, it, I just don't know you. I don't know what's going on inside of you. And l- l- I, I just got to admit to you, that's true. I have no idea. What I do have is your life and your actions. That's the evidence that causes me to stand on the stage and say what I'm saying. And if that's frustrating, I'm sorry. But I want to invite you to hear it. Now, now maybe, maybe I can soften this a little bit, okay? If you're, the reality is you're nowhere near the first person to do this if this is you. I want to suggest it's possible that it's all of us. I want to suggest that every one of us in this room has or is doing this, taking God far too lightly and maybe even worshiping a Jesus that's very similar but not the God of the Bible. And if that's you, I just want to say, like, here's the, here's the deal. You're, you're like in line four trillion in, in out of all of human history that's done this. We have accounts of this. In Deuteronomy, very shortly after Israel witnessed the power of God to help them escape Egypt, while Moses on the mountain for 40 days in God's presence, his brother Aaron, who was left in charge to lead the people of Israel, led the people to build a golden calf to worship. Now, if you're a Christian, you've grown up in church, and and you've read this passage before, maybe you're like me, and you, you look at this, and you're like, man, Israel just saw God do all this incredible stuff. Literally, a sea was split in two, and they walked through it. They saw all these plagues in Israel, including the angel of death, which, which took the lives of the firstborn children of Egypt, which is exactly what the Pharaoh had done initially. Like They saw all these signs and wonders, and merely weeks after that, they're sitting in a mountain when, God, when Moses had actually invited everyone to go with them, and they're all like, oh, I don't know about that. That God's kind of scary. I'm going to stay away. Moses goes up, gets to experience incredible intimacy with God, and on the bottom of the mountain, Aaron, Moses' brother, who, by the way, was there in Egypt to help them do all this and saw all the miracles, like, hey, guys, I got an idea. Let's build a golden baby cow and worship that. Now, a lot of times you read that, and you're like, what? Why would they do that? That's so stupid because we're sitting in that position. But here's the thing. Most of us, myself included, for a very long time, missed something really incredible in this text. Do you know what they named the golden calf? Elohim. Turn to your neighbor and say, what's Elohim? Elohim is one of God's most often used names in the Bible. They named the golden calf Elohim. And if you're starting to wonder like I was when I saw that, is it possible that they named this golden calf Elohim because they wanted a physical representation of God of the Bible? Then there's another piece of evidence a little bit later that's even crazier, and it says that Aaron in Exodus 32, 5 calls the calf Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh is a name that can and only refers to the God of the Bible because it is the name he called himself when he introduced himself to Moses. 
Aaron has led the people of Israel to worship a handmade golden calf that they named God. Now, you may be sitting here going, why is that? I don't care. There's still a golden calf. No, like, it's just a slight miss. They were intending to worship the same God that Moses was, but because Moses was on the mountain intimate with God, he knew God and came down and knew that that calf was not him. And the people had no clue because they had no idea who God was. So they worshipped something different and named it the same. We're nowhere near the first people to do it. And here's the big idea, and this is where I hope this sits in your heart a little bit tonight. It's very possible for us to create a God with the given name of Jesus and yet not know the actual Jesus who's sitting at the right hand of God. There is a Jesus in the Bible who is very wonderful, very holy, very, very much God's son, full of power and love for you. And I would venture to say that most of us have really very little idea of who he is, and yet we call him Lord. Now, as I conclude our time together, I'd like to draw your attention to the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, words that I would very much like you to pay close attention to, words that we will spend a lot of time on next week. It's going to be up on the screen. Lock in and pay attention because God has something for your heart. If you read these texts and you begin to question where you're at with Jesus, this stuff is important. It's in Scripture for a reason. Matthew 7, this is Jesus speaking, starting in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, it's talking about judgment day. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy or speak the gospel in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform miracles in your name and sing worship songs in your name and go to youth group in your name and and go to camp in your name and read my Bible in your name? And he will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And if you're beginning to wonder if that could be you, That is exactly who this text is for. Let me help you understand when the Bible repeats a word twice. In ancient writings, it's used for emphasis. The only emphasis that could be higher is if it's repeated three times. It's never repeated more than three times. It's rarely in the Bible repeated three times. It's mostly repeated twice. And in twice, the idea of Lord, Lord would imply that someone says it with deep, heartfelt emotion. My God, my God, I love you. I worship you. I've told people about you. I've been kind to people. I've I've been a good Christian. And at the judgment seat, God will deny you because he's going to say, I never knew you and you had and you never knew me. And later on in Matthew 10, 28, Jesus makes something very clear. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. And he is talking about God. Jesus himself is telling us to fear God. The word for no... This is going to get a little uncomfortable, but I I need you to hear this so that you can understand it. In the Old Testament, the Bible used the word to know. It's actually Greek or Hebrew word kenosis, and it's used many different ways. It always describes an intimate relationship and knowledge. It's often used to describe sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. He knew her. It's describing an interaction of intimacy and, 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 and closeness and deep knowing of each other, both physically, emotionally, and sexually. He knew her. It implies that, that they had a deep 
knowledge and sweet and intimate relationship of each other, care and concern for each other. The, the, what Jesus is saying here is that you may have done those things for me. You may have sang those songs for me. You may have felt a love for me, but you never knew me. And I have no idea who you are because you gave me no moments in your life. To know Jesus is an intimate, relational knowledge and intimacy. That's, that's what's going to matter. And by the way, in a sinful state, we can't have an intimate relationship with God without Jesus because our sin is in the way. That's the gap. That's why God sent Jesus, because Jesus paved a way that we could have intimacy. But we've made the mistake of believing that Jesus paved the way so that we could get fire insurance. We could say a prayer, get saved, and go live our lives however we want and have no care about God. Here's the problem. God loves you. He'll give you what you want. And if you live this life without a care or a desire for intimacy with God, he'll give you the rest of your life with that. And his lack of presence is what makes hell hell. As I close, here's my question. How are you feeling right now? Concerned? Fearful? Are you wondering, do I know? Have I committed my life to? Do I cry out, Lord, Lord, to the God of the Bible, to the only God who can save me from my sin? Or has it been a different God or one that I've been calling Jesus? Like, where am I? Perhaps right now, for the very first time, in a long time, you're not taking God too lightly. Maybe there's even a little fear in there. Can I give you a little encouragement? I hope that's where you're at. In Proverbs 9.10, the psalmist tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The way that we begin to understand and know God over and over and over in the Bible is we learn to fear Him. If you're uncomfortable, you're feeling a little, maybe even afraid that you've been following a counterfeit God, you might finally be ready to repent and turn your life over literally and completely to the one true living God. As the band comes up and we begin to prepare for this closing song, I want you to know that the front of this room is open. This area here. The space up here in front of me represents the love and grace of God. If God didn't love you, he wouldn't warn us of these things in his word. If God didn't love you, he wouldn't have sent his son to cover over our sins, even the sin of taking God too lightly. You are always and you will always be welcome to come to God and repent. To turn from your sin, to change your ways, to surrender your life to the one true God who can only be known intimately by knowing and obeying his word. We have to learn to fear him more than we fear what other people think of us. What other people think of our past, our actions. In the end of your life, the only person that will matter is Jesus. And many of us are literally crippled, myself included. We've been crippled daily 
by whether or not to get up or come up or follow God or whatever because we're worried about what other people think. We fear people. That's what it means to fear God. I'm so afraid to lose. I'm so afraid to, to, to be judged that I, I just can't get up and give my life to God because I value all these people around me, so, so I can't do it. We need to flip that. We need to have the one thing we fear the most, the one thing that we want the most, the one thing that we're afraid of losing the most, being Him and Him alone. He's the only one that matters. Tonight, where are you at? You've been taking God lightly? You've been worried about what other people think, about your past, about what you did today, yesterday, about what they think if you're going to come forward. Like, where are you at? Are you in a place where in your head and your heart you know maybe for the first time in a long time that not only have I taken God too lightly, I really haven't cared about him much at all. And frankly, I know so little of him and so little of his word that Jesus I am following, I have no idea if it's actually the real Jesus or not. Where are you at? Does it matter where you're at? Is your heart stirring? I invite you tonight to just start by being honest with God. Come forward for Him and Him alone. If you're ready, Stand, sit, get on your knees, cry, sing. I don't care what you got to do. But he loves you and he's been waiting for you to come. Let's sing together.